Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and our next guest here in studio came all the way from Connecticut to visit us. He is the head writer of the new film, State of Mind, which we carry exclusively at InfoWars.com. Uh, we're also going to be selling it in Blu-ray as well. And if you get it now, if you order it now, we're uh, not shipping them out now. We'll ship them out on the 15th of July. But you also get a free copy of The American Dream, which is the 30-minute cartoon. This is kind of a great one-two punch. State of Mind talks about the psychology of mind control and how the governments and educational institutions in our world out there are basically using us as a laboratory and getting us to do what they want. American Dream kind of goes into the people who financed all this stuff. So we turn now to our guest, Richard Grove. So Richard, thanks for joining us here on the InfoWars Nightly News. What brings you to Austin, Texas? I'm promoting a film that I helped to write and that uh, they, my, my participation started out a little bit abnormally because they interviewed me for the film and then they came and asked me to uh, help craft some of the writing. Mm -hmm. So the topic is the psychology of control, the movie's title is State of Mind, and it's about the war between our ears. It's not about a war going on out there per se in physical reality, it's about a war going on in subjective reality and really attacking the integrity of our minds. Uh, starting with youth and education and going all the way up through adults, uh, creating an extended adolescence that keeps people from being self-confident, self-reliant, and self-sufficient. That's exactly it. It keeps them in the, the nanny state. And we were talking earlier, you being from Pennsylvania, my status from moving from Louisiana to Pennsylvania is that they did treat you like a baby up there a lot more than uh, kids down in South were allowed to grow up, I think, a little quicker, drive earlier, do things earlier. When you move up there, it's a lot more rules and that's kind of where that comes from. It comes from that area of the country and spreads of well, keeping you, kids under control. What you're noticing is the evolution of the Prussian education system. Mm -hmm. And then places in the South, especially through the con Confederacy, were a little bit more self-reliant than people in the North who had already been acculturated to be this servant mentality. Yeah. And so the Prussian education system, before it was imported to America to create servants and servile thinking, it was used to create soldiers in Prussia, which had a, pre a professional military that was established but got beat by Napoleon's amateur army. And so they had a very good reason for statecraft to come up with these methods. And the Americans noticed how effective they were over there. And even today, if you travel to Germany, uh, whereas we Americans would just look both ways and cross the street, they'll wait for the sign to no. tell them, and they won't cross unless it's, it's a crossroad. Yeah. You know, so they can always tell if you're a foreigner if you're not, you know, as conditioned as they've been because they've had uh, about 50 or 60 years longer than we have. But if you look at history, that same Prussian education system led to the Nazis. It led to mm -hmm. a bunch of people with uh, operant conditioning, people who were bowing to authority, very much like the Milgram experiment demonstrates. And they said, uh, that's a great idea for America. Let's continue to bring that here because many of the people who funded the Nazis were also industrialists or bankers from America and England. And if, if uh, people out there want to get a, a long uh, oral history of opera conditioning, we did a video with uh, Charlotte Isserby. We actually went up there two different times. And one of them was the uh, miseducation of America, the psychological, um, psychological something of minds. But if you look up Charlotte Isserby Infowars on the Alex Jones channel, you'll be able to find it. Great, I mean, just from beginning to end, where it comes from, how it got here, who was, uh, who, who were the people who pushed for it to get it into our system, and what it's done today as a result. There it is, exposing the miseducation of America. That's probably on a different channel out there. Oh, that's the Alex Jones channel. Okay, that's the part one. I mean, Charlotte Isabel is a wealth of information because she was on the inside. She saw what they were using to turn against the young people of America. Sure. And she wrote The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. It's mm -hmm. a great uh, thick book that's oh, yeah. sold in the InfoWars store, if I remember correctly. Right, yeah. And uh, her, her colleague out there that does very uh, synergistic work would be John Taylor Gatto, who mm -hmm. also wrote The Underground History of Medu American Education. And uh, he did a DVD called The Ultimate History Lesson, where he lays out, uh, you know, hour by hour, this is how American values, attitudes, and behaviors were changed. And that is the very definition of mind control. Right. And so these aren't conspiracy theories. They're things uh, that of substance and validity with a great deal of facts that really show you that how our world works in, in totality, mm -hmm. and it's not the way we're taught in schools. And it's basically, this whole system was set up by the Carnegie International, uh, Endowment for International Peace, or Carnegie Endowment for Peace, and it was basically to change the way Americans thought, to keep us in this perpetual war state which we find ourselves in now. Well, as, as, as Isser B. mentions in State of Mind, as uh, does G. Edward Griffin, it's about collectivizing American personalities. Right. It's about merging America with the opposite system, that of the Soviet Union, which was funded through American International Corporation and these other Cold War PSYOP uh, fronts. Mm -hmm. So when you bring it back, 
you have uh, the foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Carnegie Foundation. And back in the 50s, there was this thing called the Reese Committee, where a whistleblower who used to work for J.P. Morgan, a very smart guy who went to Yale named Norman Dodd, mm -hmm. uh, blew the whistle. And there's two great interviews. One of them is by G. Edward Griffin back in 1981. I think the other is by Dr. Stan Monteith. And you can clearly hear Mr. Dodd elaborate that the Ford Foundation and these different foundations had minutes like uh, from their meetings, board meetings, uh, explaining how they wanted to change the values, beliefs, behaviors of America, and they do that by taking over diplomacy, statecraft, and education. Mm -hmm. That's it. They wear the, uh, the robes, their priest robes, and so by them wearing the priest robes, it puts them on a level above us, so then we listen to what they say, and that's slowly gone through time. Now, you know, you go to any um, uh, college, my, my brother was getting his master's degree, and he basically bugged out. He was like, these people are crazy. They want to do push one thing. They don't want to even talk about anything else other than their agenda. And there's nothing. And I thought maybe these people just were misunderstood or, or ignorant. He's like, no, they're doing this on purpose. Well, and there's things like the Delphi method, where you know, uh, introduced by Rand Corporation, right. it's a, you know, to bring about a set agenda, a, a, a predetermined conclusion to what seems like open discourse. And so these ideas, uh, you know, come through our society, and they are declarative sentences that are being used against us. That's mm -hmm. the psi war. Right. Not questioning those declarative sentences makes us a slave. Having stimulus response with Without thinking in the middle removes our choice but when you put thinking back in between stimulus and response that's what leads to freedom because that space gives you your choice and that choice gives you freedom and opportunity and that is our future but we all have to start thinking as individuals starting with using our five senses to observe that which exists and then organize that and root out the fallacies because mm -hmm. fallacies are used by politicians every speech I mean you can go through any Obama speech it is just stacks and stacks of fallacies and fallacy comes from the Latin term filare to deceive so these are things that we can process through our mind, through questioning, through observing what people are saying and parsing that speech. That's how we can free our minds uh, from this info war that's being waged. And now, were you always like this, um, <laughs> or, or, or was this an evolution? Did you? Have I was a lot quieter when I worked yeah. in a corporation and thought I knew a lot because I had been through an education system that taught me I was really, really smart. Right. And they say you've got a high IQ, so you're really, really smart. You're not really, really smart because of any of those things. You're smart when you start observing reality, you start asking questions, you start investigating the real roots of these institutions and, and things that make up our culture and society. Because it's right now, it's a culture of war. It's a culture mm -hmm. of death. These were not the ideas of the Founding Fathers. No. These are not rational, logical ideas of individuals. This is a, a philosophical corruption of our reality. And they've used words systematically from Kant and Hegel all the way through Bertrand Russell and Zbigniew Brzezinski to control human resources and to take away people's soul, which is your ability to use reason and engage your consciousness in this existence. Very well said. Um, I noticed in your bio, it says in 2003, you filed for whistleblower protection. And I guess that basically started on your journey, which, which leads you sitting here at this table. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You were in the corporate world, and, and let's take it from there. I had uh, several different jobs in the corporate world from 1997 through 2003, or 2004, January was the last time I worked there. So I worked in high tech. I worked in software technology of the world's largest banks, insurance companies, marketing, and media companies in New York City. And so you get to see what they want to do in their business before they even do it, because they have to plan for the software and budget for all this stuff. And so when you see clients trying to do things for the first time that would give them a strategic advantage and blocking that off from everyone else. Or you see a regulation, as I blew the whistle on, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley was created in 2002 to prevent another Enron or Tyco or any of those other big WorldCom type things that happened at the beginning of the 21st century. So I thought that would be great. I'm going to go work for this company that has a product of integrity that is mandated by our Congress to protect our economy. Mm -hmm. And so one of my clients was Tyco International. I'm meeting with the, the chief general counsel, a woman named Valley Baldassano who had recently uh, you know, just come from another pharmaceutical merger before she came to Tyco. And I said, here's, how, here's our product, it's called Email Extender, it can help you guys keep all this stuff that the F FBI has mandated that you guys are under investigation and not to delete. And they said, she said specifically, I'm not interested in keeping this information, this data. I want to know how to get rid of it and not get caught. At which point, a technical guy who had been in the company longer, he's like, oh, we can talk about that after the meeting. And that started my wheels turning. A couple weeks later, I was at the NASD, the National Association of Securities Dealers. They overwatched the stock market. Mm -hmm. They told me the product I was selling had a backdoor in it, and that the, the process of maintaining the integrity of the data from email onto the uh, long-term storage could be corrupted and that you could delete the file in mid-transit and no one would ever know it's there. And did you believe them or did you think, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about? I thought uh, I needed to do some more checking into that. Mm -hmm. And so when I questioned that, no one seemed to be concerned. 
They didn't want to know the answer. They didn't want to put the customer at ease. Let that guy go. Right. We're selling this to these other companies. Mm -hmm. And so what you find out is, uh, as I said in the live show earlier, it's like a prophylactic with a hole in it. It's mm -hmm. supposed to keep you safe in this situation, and it purposely has a back door so that the only information that they're keeping is that which they want to use for offense. And all this information that you're supposed to use for defense to defend in court or prove someone's guilty in court, that's purposely deleted. The SEC, after I called them, they said, we could put you in jail for telling us this. They were already investigating my company, who was dealing with DynCorp. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there was a whole bunch of nefarious uh, private contractors and uh, SEC regulatory you know, institutions that did not want to do anything with this. They right. didn't, they didn't want this information to see the light of day. The SEC standardized on the product that I told them had the back door in it. Wow. And I have the press release with me. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, it just really makes you wonder, you know, the, the governments and these people in these leadership positions, they set themselves up to be the be-all, end-all, mm. and we find out that they're not even trying to play by the rules that we're playing, that they force us to play by. Well, when you look at the, the, the derivatives, the quadrillions and derivatives, which are bets on bets on bets, I mean, even if you ask someone in the industry to explain it, there's no logical or reasonable explanation behind all this. Uh, you're seeing them printing money out of thin air and charging us all for the debt. Mm -hmm. That's where the national debt's coming from. So at one point uh, during the discovery of all this stuff, you're looking for other people who might uh, have some information or some experience. There's a CEO from Overstock.com named Patrick Byrne, whose dad was groomed. Uh, his dad was Jack Byrne, who was in charge of uh, CEO of Geico for many years. And I did an episode, an interview with Patrick Byrne called uh, Overstocked. It's about the deep capture of our markets through the use of these types of frauds that mm -hmm. are kept away from the American public. The press is not going to warn the public, because I went to the press, and that's how I discovered alternative media, mm -hmm. that they're not interested in you know, valid evidence that would protect Americans from being taken advantage of through the, you know, the financial fraud, the crisis, the catastrophe that's gone on since like 2006, 2007 to present. When I blew the whistle in 2003, that was all evident that it was going to happen if you had a back door across all these companies and you can launder money through all these companies without them knowing and they could be responsible for it. Right. right? And when you get into the fact that there's no regulators actually trying to watch over that stuff, it's more how can they use these things for their own private agendas. Then you, you, know, you go through the wake up and yeah. eventually you discover Alex Jones online and you yeah. discover that there's other people who are looking into these things and that there's a lot of credibility to it, but none of us can do it on our own. So we have to work together and kind of share that information to bridge the gap. And it's sometimes hard to find that smoking gun. You could put different links together and different leads together and come up with a conclusion like, oh, this is why this is happening. But it's, it's, it's finding those, those, those documents that are just red hot that say, sure. this is how it is. This is the template. This is how they're using it. Well, in a, in a, I explained my microcosm experience. Let's go to the macrocosm. A document that gives you a template for what's going on is a book that you guys sell in the InfoWars store called Tragedy and Hope, mm -hmm. A History of the World oh, yeah. in Our Time. And it's not alone. Uh, Anglo-American Establishment, Quigley's other book, clearly tells you, like, here's how the structure works. Here's how it's being funded. Here are the people. And he went inside their organization and had access to their records. So it's an incredible historical document that they try to destroy. They, sent, they destroyed the plates the of plates, it. Yeah. They republished it in 1968 under a different, different name that was only the last half of the book. Mm -hmm. So it was called The World Since 1939, A mm -hmm. History, and it contained exactly only the last half of the book. You need the first half of the book to understand the last half of the book. Some of the omitted pages cover the Bank for International Settlements being formed by the Bank of England, which is a Rothschild entity, mm -hmm. and Helmar Schacht, who was Hitler's banker. So when this clearinghouse of all banks that pr it was the predecessor of the World Bank and mm -hmm. IMF, you see its origins, then you can see its form and, f form and function. When you go to the World Bank or look at any of these other institutions, uh, that was Eugene Meyer who owned the Washington Post and was on a Federal Reserve Board, right? So these Which is guys, why the media didn't speak out against it. Well, and that's why you have you know, Woodward and Bernstein. Mm -hmm. As Rappaport says, two cub reporters who get the story of the century, that's because the establishment wanted Nixon out. Mm -hmm. There's a much bigger story there. Oh, and yeah. When I interviewed Rappaport a couple weeks ago, he's illustrating. He's like, Rockefeller, Nixon, Nazis, there's all these connections. I.G. Farben, there's all these different historical aspects that we're not taught about. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about our line of work is that there's a whole reality out there that we haven't been shown. And each day we get to like, peer a little bit further by asking questions, digging up artifacts, sharing them. And you know, John. Well, and a lot of the Watergate cover-up was just to keep people away from the links to the Kennedy assassination. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And when you look into that, um, a guy named Charles David Jackson, C.D. Jackson, uh, who ran Fortune and uh, Time Magazine, he's the guy who goes and buys the Zapruder films. He gets all the copies right. from the Secret Service yeah. and from Zapruder, and, and so you know, his job was psychological warfare. 
he was groomed by Nelson Rockefeller and uh, worked with William S. Paley, the, who was in charge of CBS. So during peacetime, these guys are in charge of your trusted media outlets. During World War II, they were psychological warfare operations. Uh, the book I would reference on that is Psy War by Daniel Lerner. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, he's a, he was a military specialist. He was in this, and there's pictures, and it's just like mind-blowing that psychological warfare plays such a huge role and is so integrated. Uh, it integrates every topic that you guys talk about on InfoWars. But really, what people need is a portal or a hub. And I really think that State of Mind was designed so that people could show this to other people in a very credible way, get their wheels turning in the, in the light direction so that they can be an individual again and let them know that there's plenty more where that came from. There's plenty more substance. But that's really the showcase to, to pass around. Right. So let's get into State of Mind. And we were covering topics that are obviously in this film, but let's get into the meat and potatoes of it. What, what do you think is the most important section of it? I mean, obviously, it's all one film as it works together. But to you, what, what section stands out? I think like the most important section is the introduction. Okay. Because that's where it connects into pretty much anyone who watches it. There's a history that you're not aware of. There's a role in history that you're being played right now. Mm -hmm. A script has been written for you, and you are acting it out every day until you stop outsourcing your thinking and start becoming an individual and not just uh, parroting what the, the corporate media says. It, it involves questioning everything and learning to take the integrity of your mind back into your own response ability. Your Trusting ability your to instincts. respond. Right. Trusting your instincts. Let's go to that introduction right now. It's almost a two-minute clip, and uh, this is the intro to State of Mind. So here it is, available at InfoWars.com exclusively. For himself, mind control is working. This is the constant battle and the struggle. What does my freedom mean to me? What is it? How deep does it go? How far reaching is it? Individuals come already with their rights. They're born with their rights. They're inherent. They're, they're hardwired. They're hardware. It's tragic. They've lost their sense of the importance of the individual, each individual. We're not animals. We're individuals. We're created in the image of God. And so what you have is everybody's born into this control structure. Everybody's born into authority. Everyone's born into this situation. But just because you have an authority making decisions for you at some point when you're very young, too young to take care of yourself, doesn't mean you should always cater to authority your whole life. Fatalism, defeatism, what Bar Morley called mental slavery. That's was a huge thing that he would sing about. How do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? Have we moved to that point of such slavery that we're too far gone? And just kind of letting it all flow by and being apathetic about it just gets you in a position of being controlled. You know, there are some people that don't care. There are some people that don't know and don't want to know. It is very frightening. If you really look at it, you would only be, you would be left with the understanding that you were obligated to do something about it. And, you know, People work really hard every day, and they just want to relax and enjoy their life. We have established a framework for, for the most part, works pretty good. People enter into this contract with society. Uh, that contract allows them to, to follow certain rules and expect certain uh, returns on their investment of working within the framework of the, con the contract. And just to remind you out there, we have a few of these left, I think less than a thousand at this point. When you buy State of Mind, you do get the free American Dream DVD along with it. A 30 minute DVD talks about the Federal Reserve, really creative. Uh, we had the filmmakers on a few times. And you get that with State of Mind. It's like a one two punch. I think it's really uh, complimentary. Yeah. I mean, that, that's it a great really short well. animated uh, cartoon that is just as, pa you know, you can pass it around to anybody and they can basically start to get into the history and they're complimentary because you know uh, the, the the American dream focuses on the history of the Federal Reserve and these international banking how they get their funding right how yeah. they get their funding how they play both sides how you know it all started back you know hundreds of years ago this isn't a plan that started last week or you know in 2000 this is a plan that's been going on that's why people can't believe it because it's been so slow and incremental they don't notice it it's just like it, it just kind of wears away like you know a, a rock in a, in a river just slowly gets you know worn down and they don't really see it happening five generations from now though but if our grandparents our great-grandparents came around and, and started looking at what was going on they'd be like wait a minute this is a lot different than the way it used to be well i think it's because it's a purposeful into uh, uh erosion 
of the integrity of the American populace. Mm -hmm. It takes away our ability to deal with the confusion that we are surrounded by every day. There's a lot of things in, in, in your environment that you might not understand, and if you don't have the ability to learn about them, you can never have true self-confidence or self-esteem by getting anything done and being productive, because you're always going to be waiting for, you know, as the Prussian education system wants you to, waiting to be told to do something. You're a reactionary. Right. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of our foreign policy is based on, being a reactionary, just waiting to see what happens and then acting on it, not building a plan and developing a system and then following through with that, no matter what else is going on. I'm carrying the ball. I'm doing my thing. That's what Alex has done every day. He didn't worry about what was going on around him. He was just going to get in front, get on the mic, get on radio, and start talking. And he's built it into you know a pretty sizable empire at this point. Well, it's an invaluable operation, not only because it provides a lot of people who are here doing investigative journalism, whereas the corporate media is not really doing this anymore. No, they're so it not provides interested. guys like you with an opportunity to work in a structured place where you're not giving every ounce of your energy to the new world order. That's awesome. But the other thing that, that InfoWars does that's so beneficial is that it covers a large spectrum of news. Maybe not as in-depth as maybe some people would want it to be, but it's letting you know it's out there. It's your mm -hmm. job. It's your responsibility to dig that up and to fact check and verify. And right. if Alex says, hey, this is a declassified document, would it hurt you to do a couple Google searches and try to find this out for yourself? Print it out and read it. Right? See what's declassified. And then, and then that, tweet and it. And we can organize these things exactly. and show people how credible, because it must be hard being on the, on the show every day, three hours, just you know, relating all this and being in the middle of all this anger that's created by this irrationality. And seeing it all happen now. But the value add would be people in the audience take it upon themselves to start documenting. It's like Alex said these things today. He doesn't have time to go out and dig these things up, and neither do you guys. So yeah. I think that's maybe more voluntary efforts, and that's where people start finding that they're valuable, they're useful, not only to themselves but to others. If you can create something of value that helps somebody else solve a problem or get through this confusion, they're interested. Somebody did that with Endgame when it came out. They, they took the time and they uh, did a bibliography of everything Alex said. They had a link to it. And they ended up sending that over. This is before I even got here. And, you know, Alex put out, I said, this is amazing. If people did that with every show, I mean, just it's here's a, a bibliography to the show. Here's all the articles he was talking about. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, that would be an amazing resource. But it really does take a lot of manpower to do that. It, it takes, does. The, you know, the, the will to just carry the ball every day. Sure, and it, it only takes manpower, it takes a, a persistent habit. You know, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the film, it starts out with habit as the enormous flywheel of society, its most precious conservative agent. It keeps the poor people away from the rich people, basically, is right. the meaning of the quote. And so what you have is a society that's set up to be stratified, and you can unstratify it by applying yourself and learning how to question into anything that we're being surrounded with, because almost every piece of corporate media is, is projected as propaganda to conceal certain aspects that are relevant from your perspective, and it's your job to go out and find those other relevant aspects, because that's where the truth resides. It's not what they're giving you. And Anthony Schaefer has a great f uh, clip that, that is in the movie. It did make the final cut, I do believe, uh, where he says, look, you have to listen to everything because it's only by purveying, uh, like, uh, uh, not surveilling, but observing what they're putting out there. If you understand psychological warfare, you can tell, even by their false information, what they're hiding, where they're trying to direct the herd. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be apart from the herd, you have to start acting like an individual and take their responsibility and start analyzing so you are away from the herd, because the herd doesn't think. It's stimulus response. Right. And we need to, you know, re-Americanize ourselves. We need to resuscitate everything that made America great and identify uh, the things that we don't like. I don't like uh, the fact that we're all forced to pay tax dollars to go kill innocent people on the other side of the world, and that we have a drone attack that killed 300 people to get two people, or, you mm -hmm. know, any of these situations. They, that it, we should be outraged. I don't think it should be normal that we know that there's baby rapists and all these organized pedophile groups out there, and nobody gets too upset about it. Like, you and can't nobody talk gets about in it. trouble about it. It just goes on. It's like, well, we put the scandal out there, so now you know about it, but most of the guys are dead, most of them are old. So, As Neil Postman said, it's uh, now this. That's the whole news mm -hmm. culture. Is they'll show you something, and then it's like, now this. Here's a commercial. You should I, feel fine about that. I think that's why the, all these scandals are coming out now. It's just we're going to keep hitting them with scandals. We're going to keep telling them how much we have them under control and how much they're being surveilled, and they're not going to care. You know, because NFL's coming up. Well, you're stumbling onto the whistleblower's worst fear. My worst fear is not death. It's blowing the whistle, losing everything that I ever worked on, and right. no one changes their activities, no one changes their behavior, no one learns from it, and Snowden feels the same thing. Oh, yeah. Sure, people know. Are they going to stop using all these social networks that are spying on them, or at least use them to their own advantage with full knowledge that what you put out there is being kept and right. archived? to have artificial intelligence software chew on it and predict your behavior. Mm -hmm. And I sold AI technology to the world's largest companies in 2003 when I worked at Panacea. Uh, these companies like General Electric, they want to be able to predict uh, outages in their system. So they created this software, but then you could take the software and apply it to individuals. And that company, uh, right after I left, uh, got staffed. Uh, the CTO came from the NSA. 
Yeah, and they changed the product into an email box monitoring system. So what's not being ca captured by Prism out there mm -hmm. is being analyzed by little, uh, you know, bot systems uh, with little spies. They're called, you know, they're basically little spies that go in through all your infrastructure to report back. And they have learning capabilities, and they have graduation and trustability capabilities. So when uh, uh, someone at the company sees an alert come up, they're like, oh, this is an educated AI module that has taken in all this data. So it's going to be pretty accurate. Right. Well, let's look here. So I don't have to look at everything. I just have to look at the targets that right. it's providing. Well, wow. let's go into a, another clip here. This one's on operant conditioning, which a lot of people don't know. This is a term that isn't talked about in public school, obviously. Uh, <laughs> obvious public reasons. school is an operant conditioning festivity. Exactly. My son knows what it means, and, uh, and uh, he is in public school at this point. I'm trying to get him out of it. I don't want the other two kids to go. But uh, he is definitely the most awake public school kid out there. He routinely gets in trouble for questioning things. And I, and I say, I, you know what? You're not in trouble by me. As long as you have the references. Exactly. And I think, you know, the habit that I've gone through is that most of the things I produced, the last episode I produced for my history show uh, was on the origins of the United States intelligence community and why they spy on us. There's like 150 plus footnotes, links, references for that one episode. But when I interviewed John Taylor Gatto for the Ultimate History Lesson, for that five hour session, there's a thousand footnotes. Mm -hmm. You can learn more from watching that one DVD set and going through those footnotes than you can at any university in this country right. or on the planet. So the fact is you can get a world class education for pennies if you know what you're looking for, but the culture we live in is not really readily going to direct you toward those methods to attain uh, high levels of certainty in your life, to be able to plan out your time to get things done, to be able to talk to people empathetically, mm -hmm. to be able to deal with other people diplomatically and not use force, fraud, and coercion. Because I right. think those are the things that are missing that they use to divide and conquer us. And that's every bit of operant conditioning because those are the habits that have been conditioned into Americans. Exactly. So let's go to that clip right now. It's operant conditioning. It is from State of Mind, The Psychology of Control. Available at Infowars.com. Building upon this dehumanization of individuals to the animal state of stimulus response, Russian researcher Ivan Pavlov and American researcher John B. Watson conducted experiments based on classical conditioning, a simple manipulation of reflexes under observable conditions. These methods were then improved and perfected by Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner was also one of these uh, famous American behaviorists, and he championed something called operant conditioning. Again, just a fancy jargon term for some basic common sense. And operant conditioning was really all about negative reinforcements like timeouts, positive reinforcements like food pellets and money, and, and punishments, which are like punishment, shocks. This operant conditioning doesn't work so good on anti-authoritarians, people who challenge and resist authority. Um, and later on, research has shown that operant conditioning works best, works best on people who are dependent, infantilized, in other words, made like children. When you ask yourself as a teacher, as I have at the college level, what have I got that my students want? Uh, sometimes a pretty discouraging uh, question, but you can uh, discover things which will be reinforcing to students at any level. And that has been done. A great deal of progress has been made. There are things in an ordinary, uh, even say a ghetto classroom, the lower grades or high school, uh, that can be used as reinforcers. Uh, you can have special foods at lunchtime, uh, access to play space, uh, privileges to associate with, with other kids of your choice. Uh, more and more of these things are, have been brought into play as, as the kinds of contrived reinforcers that can be used temporarily to get the kinds of behavior which will then eventually have their own natural consequences which will be reinforcing. So there you go. We're all being conditioned. We're all being trained. Uh, stimulus response, dog training, as Charlotte Dizerby likes to say it, uh, Skinner, Skinnerian dog training to turn us into uh, little, a little collective of a communist, essentially. That's what they're training us to be. Well, I think what you learn, you know, as you study more and more into the history is that there's only one war that's ever been waged through human history, and it's the war on consciousness, and it's, war, it's waged by the people who want to suppress consciousness. People who have a monopolistic position and they want to maintain that are going to suppress consciousness all around. And so what you have is that uh, we have consumers today because we've 
been all conditioned to act like this and to get a new car every couple of years and to just you know run up your mortgage and do all these things like live outside of our own means mm -hmm. that is a form of extended adolescence and one of the favorite uh, euphemisms that John Taylor Gatto related re uh, regarding school it's not so much dog training it goes back thousands of years this is how they trained fleas and fleas to, to break the myth the flea circus they're not trained he talks mm. about this Hubert's flea circus and mm -hmm. it was just such an amazing amazing epiphany because when you go through you find out that the fleas are categorized according to you know certain habits or certain ways of movement and then they're just harnessed to appear to draw chariots or walk a tightrope or do these different things and so in, in asking uh, you know how fleas are trained like that you have to put them all in the jar and then Gatto says they all try to jump out and, and, and follow their individual flea agendas. So you put a lid on the jar, and after a while, they all hit their head on the lid and can't get out, and they learn helplessness, right? And this is one of the things that Bruce Levine talks about in the movie. Mm -hmm. And this learned helplessness, you can now take the jar off, uh, the lid off the jar, yeah, and they won't jump out. Yeah. And Gatto realized, he says, I realized that was the lid on the jar. And that's when he decided, I'm not going to work as this advertisement, because he was the, uh, the you New York... Here? Yeah. city and state school teacher of the year yeah. and he was being used as an advertisement to mm -hmm. uphold the school system exactly. that's really damaging children right. and uh, he had a, he had a stroke a couple weeks after we did that interview so he still we still type back and forth he just types with one finger instead of before the stroke where he had two fingers yeah. so mm -hmm. he's still there he yeah. still writes prolifically and he's been writing about his first weeks in the New York City school system and it's appalling yeah. I cannot believe like what went on back then, and I can only imagine how much worse it's gotten. Uh, it's it's incredible. And you talk to these people who are in the schools, who are vested in it, and they're just like, we just need more money, we just need more money, Tenure. we just need more money, we just need more money. And what are you doing with all this money? You know, it's almost like the military. You just keep giving them more money, and they just look for who people to Who are we to scared bomb. of? Yeah. Why is America so insecure? Why know. do we have bases in 300 countries? How is that in the Americans' interest? Or is it not in the American interest? Is it an Anglo-American establishment interest? Is it, you know, this idea that... It has nothing to do with the country at this right. point. Right, and so this is the, what the book Tragedy and Hope brings out, and mm -hmm. this is what we're, we're talking about in State of Mind, because the idea of Cecil Rhodes in his last will and testament to reunite America with Britain, yeah. you know, it's something that, that goes on here in America, but Americans aren't aware of it, but most people in Britain are aware that they've wanted to get the colonies back, oh, right. and Arnold J. Toynbee is writing about how it's uh, basically blasphemy. It's, it's uh, obscene that Americans have sovereignty and mm -hmm. aren't, you know... Uh, under the divine right of kings line of rulership that they've got going over there. And that's the name of your website, tragedyandhope.com, right? Which is, of course, named after the Quigley history mm -hmm. book, because after I found the substance of that book and, and the, the central points it connected that you could work out from credibly, I just found it to be invaluable, and I thought that's a great company name because it would reinforce you know, getting people to read, checking this stuff out, finding the validity, read page 52 and learn about the Rothschild financial empire, and then go out and get 20 or 30 autobiographies or biographies written by them and learn about the people who run our world and these financial systems and control uh, enormous amounts of uh, press companies and, and financial institutions that are shaping and funding all these other working groups. And then you, you know, you learn day by day, and you learn a little bit more than you learned the day before. Well, you read <laughs> of what would happen in the past, then you see it going on around you, and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, you can predict the future. If, you, gotta, if yeah. you know where you are and you know where you were, then you can, you can map it out, as G. Edward Griffin likes to say. So the idea is that we, as, as Americans, have lost the sense of our history in the history of individualism and self-reliance and self-confidence. And in place of that, it's outsource your thinking, outsource your self-esteem through conspicuous consumption, outsource your decision-making through these elected officials that you've never met and never call you to ask what you want them to oh, do. Right. I mean, yeah. that's a total, it's a total hoax and a total ruse. So the enlightening aspects of being a whistleblower uh, came in learning about reality and finding out what exactly is going on out there and not continuing to gamble with my life in a game that I didn't know what the rules were or how to play, or what the purpose was. We were just right. all trained to, you know, uh, grow up, make a lot of money, and all your dreams will come true. And that's not true. You're thrown in the, you're thrown into the game board. You look around, you see what everybody else is doing. You're like, well, I might as well just follow these people because they look like they know what they're doing. Right. And they don't know what they're doing. And there's no adults around, so we have no. to take it upon ourselves to outgrow that uh, that adolescent mentality that someone else is responsible. No, if you see something wrong, if you see something that needs to be improved. You, that's, you know, Thomas Carlyle said, do the deed that lies closest to thee, or nearest mm -hmm. to thee, one of those two. But the idea is, you know, look around you and the things that you're unhappy about, try to be that change you want to see in the world. I mean, uh, nothing that I do today would be, would be possible without being inspired by InfoWars and seeing other people do it. And I could say, you know, I could look at it and say, well, you know, they're doing it. I can just watch. Mm -hmm. Or I could say, what's missing? What else can I add? What else can I help out with? What else can I what make angle do I have synergetic, right? right? What don't these guys have time to look into? And how can we create pieces of media that are components of knowledge that once people find out they're there, 
they can just build all the blocks, or really, they can take apart the blocks in the wall. Mm -hmm. Because masonry and Start these type of it. secret societies are the craft of, of using human resources to build their entities. And we can, as blocks, we can choose not to be blocks and walk away. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have to be stationary in our minds and left in this place where they put us. Uh, going from the script that they wrote for us, we can choose to think for ourselves, and that's the that's the whole meaning of America is to be free. Right, and we can watch their system crumble while we build a new society that you know is about individualism, is about creativity, is about honesty, is just about taking our species to the next level, which is you know. What are we here for if we're not for that? Well, and what are we here for if not to survive? I would argue that nature did not create humanity to have humanity make itself extinct. Right. At some point, humanity have to recognize uh, we have intraspecific kleptoparasites. We have people of the same species. I'm not saying they're reptiles from another planet, because mm -hmm. all I've seen through history is human beings playing tricks on other human beings. Right. But we do have to recognize that these are not apex predators. They have no right in our food chain. We are not their food. They got right. there because of our apathy. They got there because good people have done nothing in, in this country for a long time. The signs have been there from Oscar Calloway in 1918 saying, hey, these financial interests that just created the Federal Reserve just bought up everybody that's a newspaper and put editors on their staffs to control this. To and say that the Federal Reserve is a great thing. Right. And, mm -hmm. and how did the Federal Reserve come about? They had a broken money system where they said, J.P. Morgan and these guys have too much power because they saved the country many times through these crashes. Mm -hmm. And so they said, we want a new system that's based on the people. And they cheered in the Federal Reserve, just like I'm afraid we're going to cheer in this next whatever electronic currency that they want to you know, choose, because that's their goal, to have us all using money on electronic devices. That's, mm -hmm. not, a, that's not a regular individual goal. Right. Our goal is just to exchange energy in a convenient way. So that gets into what is the definition of money, what are the case histories of how money's been used and evolved through time, and through that history over several thousand years, you can look at each case study. Uh, some of these people used copper, some used iron, they used different things of currency, but so, some of the currencies start to gain momentum. And then you see city-states fall. Quigley's first book was The Evolution of Civilization, which shows these seven steps that civilization, civilizations go through. Mm -hmm. Guess which step we're in? We're in the part we're where the we decline. eat ourselves, basically, yeah. as a civilization. And that's not very cool, and it doesn't have to go that way, uh, but it is going to go that way until enough people recognize the validity, cre uh, credibility, and substance. Of, of the history that we all share. Until we get enough people to look around and realize that they're in a cave. Until we get enough people to see State of Mind and pass it around and watch it with their family, mm -hmm. co-workers, and friends. There you go. I see why they hired you as a writer. Uh, James Lane and the team who brought you uh, Oklahoma City, A Noble Lie, now have State of Mind. And uh, when you get it now, you can get American Dream. You can get that overhead shot again. Um, you can get them now at Infowars.com. And uh, we also have Blu-ray coming out, too. They're going to ship, start shipping out on July 15th, and we're going to premiere here on the 17th. You guys are going to be sitting down with us, I think, tomorrow. And um, we're going to do kind of a PBS-type-esque thing where we show the film, but we have you guys talking about it in between. I think it's going to be a rousing discussion. We're going to have uh, four of the filmmakers, two of the producers, the director, the writer here, Richard Grove. Might even get the narrator if you ask her nicely. There you go. Oh, okay, that's your fiancé who's the narrator. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, it's been great talking with you. Um, congratulations on getting this out. Congratulations on your website, too, Tragedy and Hope. Check it out. It's got a lot of good information there. And that's going to be our show for today. And remember, out there, you can get your copy now of State of Mind exclusively at Infowars.com. You've been watching the trailer. Get a copy now. Secure it now, because if you do it now, you still, still have a few of these left of the American Dream that go along with it. Great one-two punch at InfoWarsStore.com. Also, while you're there, we have the new InfoWars magazines out. They just came out today. They're going to be shipping out in the next few days. What's great about this one? Not just one page of stickers. No, we have a whole other page of stickers right here. There you go. So you get two pages of stickers. Be sure you only put them up in legal and lawful areas. We wouldn't want you to like, put them on the back of a police car or anything like that. That would not be the intention of these stickers. They're to go out there to warn people, to wake other people up in your area. But also, you have this great magazine to go along with it that you could leave at your dentist office after you're done with it or leave at your doctor's office or leave at the local pub. Get some people talking about stuff other than sports. Get them talking about the government spying on them, which has to do with this uh, topic, the topic of this month's magazine. You are the target of government spying. They want to know everything about you, but they don't want you to know that they want to know everything about you. They want to pretend like, nah, we're really not interested in you, but they are. And uh, with that, that's our show for tonight. And we will see you next time, 7 p.m. Central. Here on the InfoWars Nightly News, I'm your host, Rob Dew. We'll see you later.
Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.